food, glorious food. What's good for you? What's bad for you? And why? It's all coming up next on Health Point TV. Dr. Lorraine Massa, Chief of Staff at Mills Peninsula Health Services. Today on Health Point TV, we're going to talk about food, diet, and wellness, because the choices you put on your plate every day really do make a difference to your health. First, we're going to get the straight skinny on weight loss. With so many diets to choose from, what's really the safest, most effective way to lose weight? Next, we're going to talk about going gluten-free. It seems to be a popular trend. But is it good for you? And what about food allergies? What makes a person allergic to a specific food? And in particular, how can food allergies affect children? We'll also take a look at how to eat a good breakfast if you don't have time for breakfast. How calcium in your diet, combined with weight-bearing exercise, can help build stronger bones. And how eating right can even help you dodge the flu. The Journal of the American Medical Association states that over 60% of the American population is overweight or obese. We know that's a risk factor for heart disease, type 2 diabetes, gallstones, and some cancers. Every day we hear about a new diet on the market. What do we do? We want to actually think of something more like a lifestyle change instead of just a crash diet. So there are a lot of diet options and you can really pick almost any diet plan as long as it's nutritionally balanced. So we have calories in and then we have calories out. And this balance is what determines your weight loss or your weight gain. When your calories in and your calories out are the same, you have no change or weight maintenance. When your calories in are big and your calories out are small, then you have weight gain. And when your calories in are low and your calories out are big, that's the weight loss. So there are a lot of strategies that you can use to try to get that negative calorie balance. And all diets are really just sort of gimmicks to try to get you there. There is no perfect plan for anyone, but fruits and vegetables are a great place to start. Produce, fruits and vegetables are full of fiber, they're low in calories and packed full of phytonutrients that can improve digestion and help prevent certain types of cancer. Other components of a healthy diet are protein and dairy that are low in saturated fat, like skim milk, fish, and lean meats. For healthy fats, choose monounsaturated fats like olive oil and small amounts of nuts. Carbohydrates are also an important part of the diet too. The best are those from fruits and vegetables, but whole grains are great in moderation. I would make sure that you're not trying a diet that has extreme promises or unrealistic expectations. When you gain weight, it usually happens over a longer period of time, so you shouldn't expect to lose it over a week or a couple of days. So I would avoid things like juice cleanses or fasts, things like the lemonade diet, where you're just drinking lemonade and cayenne pepper and honey. This is not a realistic long-term diet, and any weight loss that you have in the three days that you do it is not sustainable. We've learned that there are important chemical messengers that originate in our intestines and travel up to our brain while we're eating. They signal our brain when we've had enough to eat, we should be satisfied. But if you're like a typical American, eating your food in front of the TV, or while you're working on the computer, or standing over the sink, you're not gonna get that message from your intestine to your brain. It's being sent but you're not hearing it. So they've done studies on successful weight loss maintainers. And two of the things that they all do is they exercise regularly. If you do weight training and build muscle mass, you'll actually boost your metabolism. 
Other things that they found with the weight loss maintainers is that they tend to eat the same kinds of meals all the time. You want to eat a balanced, healthy meal every day of the week. The up and down with the, with the cheat foods, like cheesecake just on Saturday, is not a good long-term plan. You can also keep a food diary. You can track your calories in, you can track the calories out, and you can see exactly where the calorie, where the calorie gain is coming from. And an easy sort of eyeball way to decrease your calories in is to eat by plate. So when you look at your plate, you only get one plate, by the way, you cut the plate in half, and this first half is all vegetables. The other half of the plate, you cut into quarters. You put one quarter lean proteins, so like chicken breast, fish. You can use lean red meat, like lean beef or, or pork. That's okay, as long as the portion's small. And then the last quarter is carbs. And you wanna make sure this is high fiber whole grains. So things like whole wheat pasta, brown rice, barley, quinoa sweet potatoes, things like that. What about snacking? Many people sit at the computer during the day and nibble on chips or nuts or trail mix. That can add up to a lot of calories. It's better if you can sit down to three balanced meals in the day. If you're really trying small portions at your meals, you might need a snack in between, but make it a planned snack. Choose either a fresh fruit or some raw veggies to snack on. Your body will love you for it. For most people, there are probably a lot of ways that they can improve their lifestyle, but it's hard to get started. So I always recommend that you talk to your doctor and see if you guys can figure out some suggestions for improvement. And when you do start, I would say set one goal per month. And once you've actually changed the habit and it's become part of your lifestyle and it's not something you're thinking about all the time, then that's great. You can pat yourself on the back and move on to the next big change. And then maybe in a year, you'll see that you've made a lot of improvements and you're much healthier and hopefully a little bit slimmer. When Samantha was 14 months old, we decided to give her peanut butter for the first time. And the very first morning that she had it, she showed no reaction at all. So we waited three days, like our pediatrician told us to, and she still was showing no reaction, so we fed it to her a second time. This time, unfortunately, she reacted immediately, within seconds. Her lips started swelling up. She started making funny noises, indicating that her tongue was swelling up as well. As I removed her from the high chair, she, I noticed that she had hives all over her body. And then we walked to the counter, and at that point, she actually lost consciousness. Well, obviously, food allergy is when your immune system uh, reacts to a food that you've eaten or, or that's touched your skin, and it, in overreacting, causes symptoms that really ought not to occur if you just ate the food. So I, I remember very distinctly putting 911 on speakerphone and telling them that my baby was dying, that my baby ate peanut butter and was dying, and to hurry. So anaphylaxis is an allergic reaction involving more than one organ system. And it might involve the GI tract and respiratory, or the GI tract and skin, or the GI tract and the respiratory tract and skin. As you can see, as more organ systems are involved, it can become much more serious. As I was waiting for them, I was lucky that I was able to take Benadryl in my fingers and rub it on her tongue. And that seemed to be just enough to get a little air in her. So she then regained consciousness and I could give her a sip of Benadryl while we waited for the ambulance. Over 90% of all food allergies are, are, are caused by a really limited number of foods, and they include uh, milk and dairy products, eggs, soy, wheat, corn, seafood, and that includes both fish and uh, shellfish, peanuts, tree nuts, and then the new kid on the block, sesame. So why is, is food allergy more serious than pollen allergy or dog allergy? What about just breaking out in hives is, why is that dangerous? The reason why it's dangerous or potentially danger, dangerous is that we know you've eaten the food. We know you're having an allergic reaction and the reaction may evolve over time. Perhaps the first symptom are hives, but if untreated, you may then later develop difficulty breathing, falling blood pressure, um, and more severe symptoms of anaphylaxis. The most difficult thing to manage when you have a child with food allergies is how to minimize their risk and keep them safe while still allowing them to fully participate in all the fun activities that involve food in life. On the labels of food, I check before I um, 
eat the food. From birthday parties to outings to school settings. And I don't share food with my friends. It, it can be very challenging. If I'm at a bakery or something that there are no peanut butter cookies or peanut butter flavors and anything. We have many children uh, in the practice who, who do have anaphylaxis to a variety of, of foods and they, have a, they take home a food allergy action plan. The most important thing that we have to do as parents when you're talking about an anaphylactic food allergy is addressing EpiPens because that's really our only lifeline. It's our only safety measure to ensure that if she did have a reaction that we could save her. So the first thing we do is we administer epinephrine. It usually comes as an auto-injector. Uh, common names are EpiPen and AviQ. That's the first thing you do. The earlier you administer epinephrine, the more effective it is. And you will really decrease the severity of the reaction, shorten the duration of the reaction, and it can be life-saving. Well, every day I make sure to wear my EpiPen around my waist. So in case of an emergency, um, an adult or myself could inject it into me quickly. From teachers to staff to parents that are managing a play date, that they understand how to use those EpiPens. The next thing you do is dial 911. An anaphylactic reaction will last from two to four hours, but epinephrine only lasts for 20 minutes. So it, epinephrine is your first step, and it get, buys you time to get your child or your family member to emergency care. There are some specific things we do at school. We create a buffer zone for her when she eats lunch, which means the children on either side of her and the children directly across from her, their lunches have to be peanut free. Well, my friends, they also tell me when somebody has peanut butter across from me at lunch, then my friends get up with me and we leave so we can still be together. Now that she's in fourth grade, she can really self-manage this. And because she's been doing it for five years, all the other students understand it as well and I just think it's really nice that they know and they support me and help keep me safe. Do you want strong, healthy bones? Then you need to keep your calcium intake up and your bones in motion. So let's get moving. When it comes to building bone density and bone strength, not just any exercise will do. The key is to do weight-bearing exercise. The term weight-bearing describes any activity that you do on your feet that works your bones and muscles against gravity. People often forget that bones are actually living tissue that constantly breaks down and reforms. So when you do weight-bearing exercises on a regular basis, your bone adapts to the impact of the weight and the pull on your muscles by building more cells and becoming stronger. Many popular sports are also great forms of weight-bearing exercise. Weight-bearing exercise is particularly important for women, especially since our risk for osteoporosis is so much greater, especially after menopause. So be patient. The bone-building phase in young adults can take three to four months, and even longer if you have osteoporosis or if you're an older person. So you won't see a big change on your bone density test after working out for only a week. But just keep at it. Bones change slowly, but they do change. Thousands of people, from movie stars to mainstream Americans, have sworn off gluten. They claim that a gluten-free diet has helped them shed unwanted pounds, boost their energy, and feel healthier. What exactly is gluten? I have no clue, a clue what that is. <laughs> I have no idea. I know I don't have any idea. I really don't. I have no idea what it actually is. It's the binding, uh, it's like a, it kind of makes it Kind of coagulate, I guess. It's like a, almost like a... A glue, a glue that bonds, it's a bonding agent. Gluing thing that is found in, naturally in uh, any of the grains. Some kind of sugar ingredient. It's like fat. It makes the bread expand like yeast. I know it's bad for you. <laughs> I have no idea. Although I'm not quite sure what gluten actually is. I'd be truthful with you, I don't know. It's uh, some component that is in certain foods that can cause some allergies or some, uh, some people that cannot process it uh, very well. I know it's like related to celiac disease or something like that. People with celiac can't eat gluten. Honestly, I have no idea. But since people are saying that you shouldn't be eating it, then I guess they know what they're talking about. Actually, 
Gluten is simply a protein complex found in grains such as wheat, barley, and rye. And for most of us, it's a very useful protein. It's what makes pizza dough stretchy. It gives bread its spongy texture. And it makes sauces and soups thicker and creamier. People who eat gluten-free diets typically avoid bread, crackers, and pasta. But that's just the start. Gluten is a compound found in an amazing array of foods. It's even found in some brands of toothpaste and cosmetics. So if gluten is so hard to avoid, why are so many people choosing to go gluten-free? Is this increasingly popular eating trend good for you? Or even safe? That is a very good question. Should the general public go on a gluten-free diet? And if you quizzed several different authorities on this, you probably get a host of different answers. I personally feel you should not. If you have symptoms after you consume gluten products, then you may, it may merit a trial of staying off gluten. For instance, these symptoms can range from simply abdominal discomfort, bloating and belching. And again, I ha you have to understand that gluten intolerance is a spectrum of disease. At one end of the spectrum, there are those individuals that are simply gluten sensitive. That is, when they're exposed to this gluten-containing product, they get the above, the, the symptoms I'd mentioned earlier. At the end of the spectrum, you see a full-blown disease called celiac disease. Now, these individuals actually have much worse symptoms. They also get full-blown disease due to the contact of the gluten protein to the intestinal wall. This results in a syndrome called malabsorption. These individuals actually end up losing weight and having a lot more symptoms such as vitamin malabsorptions. Consult your physician first and then think about it. Do I feel better when I avoid gluten? If you do, then stick with it. See how you feel. You could always re-challenge yourself and see if it causes the symptoms to come back. If it does, then I'd certainly recommend you stayed off it. Of course, first of all, your physician would have made sure that you do not have the full-blown celiac disease, and then we go forward with you staying off a gluten-containing product. But I would strongly feel that, you, that the general public should not completely avoid gluten. Gluten is a harmless protein in most individuals. It is not essential. So if you stayed off it, you're not going to get hurt. But believe me, it is quite difficult to find foods and food products that contain entirely no gluten. Mom always told us that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. What do you think? I think it is important, but I just don't, I don't make time for it. Well, I make sure that my son has breakfast, but me, if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. Oh, I don't eat breakfast. I don't have time for it. I'd rather sleep. Based on being on diets and off diets, I found that, that breakfast is important. The real story on breakfast may surprise you. Let's find out more. Mom most certainly was right. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It sets the tone for the whole day. If you eat the right breakfast, your energy levels will be up, your metabolism will be running efficiently, and your brain will be sharp. Like your car needs energy and fuel, your body needs it as well. Your metabolism adjusts to a slow burn overnight so that if you skip breakfast, your body utilizes calories at a slower rate. Research shows that people who don't eat breakfast are more likely to be overweight. A balanced breakfast should contain seven to 10 grams of protein, and that would be what you might find in an egg or an ounce of cheese or a couple tablespoons of peanut butter. Also about 30 grams of complex carbohydrates is ideal, and that might be whole wheat bread, it might be oatmeal, it might be an English muffin or a corn tortilla. Simple sugars that you would find in sweet coffee drinks, breakfast cereals, fruit juice, usually give you some quick energy, but then you, you have the letdown that happens later in the morning. A balanced breakfast containing protein and complex carbohydrates is gonna keep your metabolism running more efficiently, your energy levels up, and your appetite in check because the nutrients will be delivered more slowly and steadily. When you don't eat a good breakfast, your metabolism is not gonna be running efficiently, your appetite is gonna be increased, so that by the time you get ready for your next meal, you're not gonna make good food choices. 
let's paint a picture of that. You skipped breakfast, you walk into a business lunch in a fine restaurant, you're looking at the menu, all that rich, high fat food is gonna look a lot more appealing and it's gonna wind up on your plate and it will be very easy for you to gain weight. Couple that with a slow metabolism, you're really in for trouble. So we know you have to eat a good breakfast, but you say you don't have time. So how are you gonna accomplish this? Bottom line is planning ahead. You have to shop, you have to have the food on hand, and you have to be ready. Sometimes assembling the ingredients the night before can be really helpful. There's a lot of great meals that you can pull together with just a few minutes in the morning. How about a fresh apple with cheddar cheese cubes and walnuts? How about a morning pizza made with an English muffin, ricotta cheese, sliced tomato, little salt and pepper, and a drizzle of olive oil. Delicious. Maybe a breakfast smoothie made with soy, almond, or cow's milk. Add some Greek yogurt, protein powder, maybe some fresh fruit, blended with ice, and served in a cup to go. There's always a breakfast burrito with a whole grain or corn tortilla, egg, a little cheese, and salsa. So suppose your first stop of the day is the gym. Should you have breakfast or not? Absolutely. Research shows that you can't burn fat efficiently unless you have some fuel on board. So a light meal or snack would be ideal. Maybe a piece of toast with some peanut butter, perhaps a balanced energy bar, or maybe a small protein shake. So you've had your snack, you've had your workout, now what? You should go back and eat your balanced breakfast. Some of the ideas that we talked about earlier would be good choices. So whether you've been to the gym or you're just rolling out of bed and heading off to school or work, breakfast is important. With a balanced breakfast, you'll set out on the right foot for the rest of the day. Eating well clearly has many benefits for all of us, from staying fit to feeling energized. But a healthy diet can also help you avoid getting sick. Here's how the care and feeding of your immune system, along with your flu shot, might help you skip the flu. The number of people who um, are affected by the flu from year to year changes uh, quite a bit. It's usually somewhere between 5 to 20 percent of the American population. And of those people who get sick, more than 200,000 end up in the hospital. And somewhere between 4,000 and 50,000 end up dying of the flu every year in the U.S. Yeah, most people don't realize that uh, the Flu can end you up in the hospital with a pneumonia, and that's probably the most common cause of death associated with the flu, but it also increases your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. Unfortunately, anybody can get the flu. Um, it's an it's a infectious agent, and anybody can get sick. I think the more important question is, who's going to get seriously ill when they get the flu? And that's the people that are either in the extremes of age, the, the very young kids, or um, or the elderly. The good news is there are lots of studies that show that you can boost your immune system by the way you eat, and in particular, having diets that are rich in antioxidants and in vitamins will make your immune system stronger. Specifically, having diets rich in uh, green leafy vegetables and broccoli, fruits, especially the berries that are, the dark berries that are high in antioxidants, olive oil, garlic, all of those things have been associated with an improved immune system and a propensity to stay healthy. There are many fruits and vegetables that can help keep our immune system healthy and keep our cells healthy during the flu season. Our fruits and vegetables come in many colors, such as blue and purple and red and orange and yellow and green. And all these different colors provide us with different nutrients that help keep our immune system strong and can help our immune system fight off the bad guys. There's many foods that can help keep your immune system healthy. Our immune system is a complex system and many nutrients are required to keep it healthy. For example, one of the nutrients I like to talk about is beta carotene, which converts into our body into vitamin A. Another important nutrient for our immune system is vitamin C. Vitamin C helps in wound healing. So when you cut yourself, the vitamin C acts as a glue and helps your skin heal back together. Wouldn't it be great if we could just take one pill and it would cure all our immune system and keep us healthy and happy. The vitamin C supplements, the echinacea, and the little fizzy guys that you put in your water. Do those really work? Unfortunately, they don't work. And here's why. Our immune system, as I mentioned earlier, is very complicated. It requires many nutrients to keep it healthy. If we take just an excess of one or a super dose of one, we don't know how the other nutrients are going to be affected. 
We need a variety of fruits and vegetables and protein to keep our immune system healthy. And here's another reason why it's better to choose fresh fruits versus a pill form. When you have a pill of vitamin C versus a fresh orange, which do you think your body's gonna absorb better? your body will absorb the vitamin C better from the fresh orange. And this has been well documented in studies over the years of many different vitamins. When they compare the nutrients absorbed from a pill and the nutrients absorbed from a fresh fruit, such as a fresh orange, the fresh orange always wins out. Our body always absorbs more vitamin C from the fresh orange. The good news is that there are a lot of things that we can do to help stay healthy. Um, sleeping enough, stress reduction, exercise, eating the right things, and of course, uh, getting a flu shot. Some people, some of my patients say they don't want to get the flu shot because it doesn't really work. Well, the statistics show that the flu shot tends to be about 50 to 75% effective in preventing the flu. And even if you are unlucky enough to get the flu after the flu shot, it doesn't tend to be as severe. Humans do not build up an immunity to flu shots um, for several reasons. One, vaccinations actually improve your immune system. Um, unlike the resistance you might build up with antibiotics, it's a completely different mechanism of uh, attacking it. You're strengthening your own body's reserves to do the work on its own so that outside chemicals are not necessary. The other thing to realize is that unfortunately, and this is what makes influenza so unique, it mutates, it changes uh, in part dramatically from one year to the next, which is why it's so infectious and which is why it's so dangerous, and which unfortunately is why we need to get a new flu shot every year. I work with the San Francisco Girls Chorus, many young girls, and sometimes they're a breeding ground for illnesses when they come to rehearsals, and I tend to pick that up. About 10 years ago, I was tired of getting sick, so I asked my doctor what to do, she started giving me flu shots, and I can't remember the last time I had the flu. If you're thinking about getting a flu shot, I would strongly recommend it. Uh, it takes the place of being sick for so many days, feeling awful, losing work time, and then getting back your strength again. It takes about two seconds, it's a little pinprick, you don't feel a thing, you don't get the flu, there are no side effects, go do it. To learn more about the health care services and professionals at Mills Peninsula, please visit us online. Thank you for joining us on this edition of HealthPoint TV. See you next time.